you, George. And again, thank you everyone for coming along. I think it's been a, a good day so far. We've got some important information. And I do really want to build on what Sue's and Sean have been talking about already. We've got some tropical species here that are quite suited to the system, but we need to really understand nutritionally what's going on with them. And again, just to give a bit of a plug, why are legumes so important? And I just want to remind you exactly what Sean said. They're really important for the quality component. High crude protein, really important for our animal production. We've also got the idea of atmospheric end fixation, and that's really important as well. It's that atmospheric end fixation which is going to be driving our system, particularly with our C4 grasses, high end requirement. They really need to see a lot of end in the system. So today what I want to talk about though is why we might be having trouble not keeping the legume in the system because what we've been finding previously is that our legumes don't always persist. Sue's was saying about how Desmanthus doesn't always persist in the sward. Why might that be? What are the reasons why our legume might be falling out of that pasture sward a bit quick, too quickly? And there's a couple of reasons. I think firstly, the Desmanthus, as Sue's has already said, is highly palatable, isn't it? The, uh, the cattle, sheep, they're going to selectively graze that legume component before the grass. So what that's going to mean is if it's knocked down too hard and there's no recovery period, we're really not going to see a, a good uh, competitive uh, nature from that legume. The other thing which I'm really interested in, and Chris as well, thinking about the nutrient requirements. We know from our temperate species, a lot of our uh, temperate legumes, if we think about subclover for example, has a much higher requirement for nutrients, particularly phosphorus about 30% higher than our grasses. We don't really know what our legumes require. So what we've been working on in our LPP project, and I'm going to just give a brief rundown of the main take home messages. I'll point them out as we go. We want to understand what's going on with our tropical legumes in terms of nutrition. Firstly, what are their requirements? If we understand what the grass needs and what the legume needs, we can then start to possibly tailor make the fertilizer program for that. So firstly, understanding what are the requirements. Secondly, understanding how do we manage for whatever differences there are. Because one of the interesting things Suze was just saying before was that Desmanthus doesn't really produce the yield that Lucent does. And in my mind, straight away what that means is it's just not going to be quite as competitive in terms of shoot biomass compared to our grass. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, just very broadly around tropical species, what are grasses and legumes doing? Why is it so important? And then I am going to come back and focus on Digit and Desmanthus because what we've found is that they are quite a good combination. They're showing good traits uh, in terms of a competitive pasture sward. So when we think about uh, the, the species we've got, the first thing that we've found is that there is a large difference in yield potential. If we take Digit, Panic, Buffalo grass, any of those tropical species, the yield potential from the grass is just so much higher than the legume. What we're finding is that the grass is just going to overwhelm that legume component. So if we take a step back and we think about selective grazing, how palatable that legume is, if that legume is grazed down hard and the grass remains a little bit and there's really no grazing management, what we'll find is that grass is going to start to outcompete. And really at the end of today, I think what you'll take away from my talk, same as what Sue's was saying, we need management. If we want something to persist, we need to be managing that sward. And I acknowledge the further north we go, the further west we go, that's harder. But we need some sort of management to try and maintain our pasture, particularly our legume component. So there's that difference in yield potential. The grasses are really punching above their weight. They're doing well. The other thing is though that there's differences in nutrient requirements. And that's the first objective of the LPP project and what we're interested in. And one of the things that we commonly talk about is, well, what's the critical requirement? How much phosphorus fertilizer do our species need to achieve near maximum yield? That's what we're interested in knowing. Because if we know what that level is, we can start to make decisions around fertilizer application. We can start to make decisions around, well, what species might actually match up. And one of the easiest ways to think about our critical requirements is our tissue P. How much phosphorus is in the tissue of those plants? And what we've found so far, our grasses generally need about 0.15 to 0.2% P. Our legumes, somewhere around 0.2 to 0.25%. So again, we see the grass has that slight advantage. 
they're just a little bit more efficient at using that phosphorus. Why is that happening? And that's the question that us as scientists ask and maybe other people aren't quite as interested. But what I'm interested in is what's going on in that pot? We can actually see what's happening on top of the surface and yes, that's what's going to be grazed. But everything that's occurring up here is determined by what's happening down there. And Sean was telling us the importance of water use efficiency. We're trying to maximize the use of that water that we've got. And now what I want to talk about is what nutrition, in particular phosphorus, do we have and how are we maximizing it? Why are there differences between grasses and legumes? And the big difference is around the root system. If we take digit grass, which is growing quite well up there, it'll produce about five times as much root length as these desmanthus plants. It's foraging that soil very effectively for phosphorus. The root hair length is about three to four times as much. So the picture we're thinking about there is that the grasses are just so much better at finding that nutrition. More roots means that they search for it. They don't need it quite as much in the soil, but they also respond to it if it's in patches. And as we all know, our systems aren't uniform. It's not homogenous. We're dealing with very patchy kind of systems. Our grasses tend to respond quite well to those patches. But interestingly, in some of our research, what we've found is that our desmanthus also proliferates. And straight away what that means is that we can start to manipulate the placement of that fertiliser and what we can actually do with our species. So, so far what I hope you're bringing along from this is that grasses, they're highly productive, they yield really well, and it's because they're punching above their weight below ground. They're exploring that soil, they're acquiring those nutrients. But the good thing is that our legume, if we place the phosphorus somewhere in the vicinity of the roots, it will start to respond a little bit. And I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly. So what we want to think about now, that's just in general terms, tropical grasses, tropical legumes, there's big differences. Let's think about digit and desmanthus in particular. Suze was saying how well desmanthus is suited in terms of the agronomic conditions around here. We get the right cultivar, we select the right species, it's going to go quite well. And what we need to do is not only match it up in terms of the agronomy, we want to match it up in terms of how well those plants are going to compete for available nutrition. If we've got a grass that is just so highly competitive, is competing for the limited phosphorus that we might have, it's going to outyield that legume. That legume just isn't going to persist. And what we've found so far is that our desmanthus and our digit combination is working quite well. Although there is a difference in yield potential, although there is a difference in critical P requirement, desmanthus somehow keeps up. It stays in that sward. Now, a lot of the work we're doing is relatively early on. So we're mainly focused on pot trial work, looking at the mechanisms around why the plants are doing what they're doing. But the whole idea is that if we can get these plants going and going well in the first year, a well-established legume will lead to a highly productive legume component and hopefully at the end of that first year we'll be setting seed, just like what Suze was talking about. So it's really important to actually get the nutrition right so we get the, give these legumes a really good start in the environment. A good start means we're more likely to see persistence throughout. But now what I want to talk about is really the key take-home message in my mind and that's the importance of actually providing them with something to get going with in the first place. Suze rattled off all the important aspects of getting a desmanthus pasture in, and she missed one really important thing, and that's not because it's not important, but that's because I'm gonna talk about it now, and that's nutrition. How important is starter fertilizer? So we've cleared our paddock, it's a weed-free fallow, we're doing well in terms of our soil moisture. Now we want to think about our nutrition. Is it actually worth putting nutrition under our pasture? And I'm going to say yes. I know that Suze would say yes because she made one really good point. We need to start to treat our pastures like their crops. They're plants, they need nutrition, we need to get them going well. So in terms of start and nutrition, what we're trying to achieve, fast establishment, fast canopy closure, so they're actually competing with the other species in the sward, particularly those tropical grasses which are so competitive. So we took a relatively low pea soil, I think it was a coal well of about 10 to 15, and we looked at increasing rates of starter fertiliser, so including N and P, so it was MAP fertiliser. 
And we were interested to know, well, how important is that fertilizer for those species? And we had rates all the way from zero up to 48 kilos of pea per hectare. Now that's quite high, I acknowledge that. But that legume kept responding all the way to that top of the curve. It was still responding to 48 kilos of pea per hectare. So that's one of the next take home messages. The, le the legume component really needs starter fertilizer. It really needs something to get it going. So it establishes, so it's going to be productive. In contrast, if we think about our digit, it responded up to about 12 kilos of pea per hectare. After that, it really wasn't needing any extra nutrition. So straight away, again, that's consistent with our whole understanding that yes, the grasses are more efficient, they're going to be really productive with less fertilizer. But at this stage, what I want you to think about, start a fertilizer. We need to be considering it when we're getting our pastures in. So after that, I suppose what we have to ask ourselves is, well, how do we actually help the legume along? Because I think what we need to be doing is somehow disadvantaging the grass or advantaging the legume. We need to be giving this legume just a bit of a leg up so it gets a good start on. So what we looked at after that was how can we spatially arrange our sowing config, uh, configuration to help the legume a little bit. So we looked at planting the digit and desmanthus in the same row, planting them in separate rows, putting the fertilizer banded below the seed or spreading it on the surface. And what we found quite interestingly, and Chris doesn't know this yet, um, what we found was that it really doesn't matter where they're placed. It doesn't matter whether the fertilizer is on the surface or whether it's banded below, they all yielded exactly the same. So again, the take home message from that is that we need starter fertilizer. It's certainly important. But one of the other treatments we had was we separated the grass and the legume and we preferentially placed the pea fertilizer below the legume component. Because we thought, let's really give it a good kick along. Is that going to help? And I know most of you will be thinking, well, that's, that's a bit of a pain, isn't it? We're going to have to start separating our sowing rig and putting grass and legume down separately. And I acknowledge that's, that's difficult, but what we found was that the proportion of legume increased by about 40% when we preferentially fertilised just the legume component compared to the grass. And what's interesting about that is that the grass itself really didn't suffer any loss in terms of yield. So we're not really decreasing our productivity from the pasture, but we're really increasing the productivity of our legume component, increasing the chance it's got to actually establish, be productive and set seed for seedling recruitment later on. So I suppose that's the next step you can think about. Do we start to give our legumes a really good chance, particularly in the first year? Because although we may get that fertilizer under the legume to begin with, we know our grasses are competitive, their roots are going to forage in the soil, it's quite likely they're going to find that phosphorus a little bit later on at some point. Now just interestingly to finish up with, a bit more of an academic question, but goes back to what Sean was talking about with water. One of the things that we find with our grass and even our, our desmanthus is that as we proliferate roots in the soil, as they're foraging, as they're acquiring phosphorus, they actually start to dry out the soil around where all that nutrition is placed. So what we need to think about is, well, is this system going to become self-limiting to some degree? If we place a band of fertilizer below a legume, is that going to say, well, I've taken all the water I can, that phosphorus is no longer available. And you might think, well, that's no good. We've lost our pea acquisition. That's, that's going to slow the system down. But it actually could be quite quite a good thing because if we preferentially place the legume, uh, the pea fertilizer below the legume, the legume draws down on it and then makes it unavailable. When it rains again, the legume is going to have first shot at that phosphorus. So we may actually get a carryover effect into subsequent seasons from that fertilizer application. So that's pretty much all I have in mind. The key take home messages are, yes, we've got big differences in our grass and our legume. We know the digit is really going to outcompete the desmanthus, but I encourage you just to think firstly about some sort of starter nutrition. Even if you're giving both of them a bit of starter nutrition, that's better than nothing. Get them both going and particularly get that, that legume up, up and running. But really what I want to encourage you to think about is the more you actually manage your pasture, the more likely you're actually going to keep that legume component in there. It's not just nutrition. If we take a step back, 
if the legume's preferentially grazed and there's no recovery period, we're just not going to get any sort of uh, persistence productivity out of our legume. So hopefully there's something interesting in, in there for you to think about, and I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions that you have. Yeah, just wondering if you found any difference between um, like organic pea and synthetic pea applications. Uh, we haven't really looked at that too much yet. We've mainly been focused on our, our starter, starter pea application, so mainly MAP. Um, and really what we've found so far is that if we're looking, you know, somewhere up to around the 12 kilos of pea per hectare, we're getting a pretty good response out of both, both species. Um, but obviously that's looking at a pot system. Um, they're rather large pots, like we're looking at a, a proper sward where we've sown them at 50% uh, uh, of each, our grass and our legume. But really at this stage it is just our synthetic fer fertiliser that we've been looking at. Yep. Um, on the slopes we're fairly um, devoid of sulphur. Yep. Naturally, have you done anything with that? Uh, not yet, but that is that is one thing we're thinking about. So sulphur, uh, yeah, anecdotal evidence that Desmanthus is quite responsive to sulphur. One of the things you come across, and like Suze has mentioned, they drop their leaves. Um, they drop them over, over winter when it's cold. They will drop them when they get a bit water stressed. And it's possible there's something going on with sulphur, sulphur there. We've even found in our pot trials, when theoretically they've got adequate nutrition, they are still, they've got yellow leaves and something's going on there. So we do want to have a look at sulphur and potassium and that interaction with, with phosphorus here. Yeah. Yep. You talked about uh, alternate rows. Um, have you got any comments or of potential for alternate strips? So, sowing desmanthus. Yeah, I mean that—that's the other. That would be the other way of potentially achieving it. Um, and I suppose you're thinking then of you've pretty much got a hundred percent legume, a hundred percent grass. In some ways, that could make it easier to manage, but with the, one of the key drivers being that you want the legume to fix atmosphere again. You're sort of fixing it all in one place and the grass is over there somewhere else. Um, so that could help in terms of just purely productivity and persistence out of the legume. Uh, but it's just to try and get that legume into the sward as a mixed, uh, mixed sward. Because as Sean said, when you get them together, their total yield is actually higher when they're, when, than when they're grown separately. So it's, it's getting them together, competing and using as much of those available resources as possible. Yep. Yep. One of the issues with, in our district with legumes is the lack of molly, zinc and boron. Yep. And it's an integral part of trying to get the legumes to establish. No. Right. And you, you were talking about it before with, with um, I know you're working on phosphorus, but you said nutrition. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would have thought of more complete, considering you're spending that much money at the start, you're better off to go with something a bit more complete and make sure you've got all the nutrients sorted. Yeah, de definitely. If, you're, if you've got a known nutrient deficiency, like you'd certainly want to want to get on top of that. Um, and particularly if you think about, about molly, I mean, a lot of the time we're, we're planting these on alkaline soil, um, they do tend to perform better in our heavier soil types where we have got uh, an alkaline pH. Uh, but as Suze was saying, we've, we've looked at JCU one to nine, and I think out of those nine cultivars, JCU nine is one of the better ones for sandier possibly uh, more acid soils and we've we've found that with our trial work and when you come into your acid soils you're more likely to come across your molly for example but i suppose your yeah, zinc would be a bit of an issue in your your alkaline soil so if there is a known nutrient deficiency yes definitely correct that uh, but then after that it's really getting your your n and p because i mean n's going to be driving your shoot yield we're wanting to try and maximize canopy closure as quickly as possible P is really important for our root growth and we're really wanting to forage in that soil, develop our root length, not only for nutrition but also our, our water acquisition as well.